listening to the Earth Hotel Podcast. Let me take you now to the gods. Welcome back. This is the Earth Hotel. I'm Jackie Cotillard. That's me. To begin with, I want to fact check one of the stories that we did last week. I said that Dick Cheney essentially could be arrested by anyone with a badge for war crimes, and he is wanted multiple places, including Venezuela. Uh, That is not true. Venezuela, essentially, they don't want them in their country, but there is nothing they could technically do about it. But they were vocally against George W. Bush and Dick Cheney being around their parts. No international court has brought any kind of conviction or anything against them or attempted to, in fact, against any American in history. So that's that's an untrue statement, but apparently whatever world that statement was made in, it was factual. Unsure. Things are getting fuzzy around here, but I want to try to give the truth where I can verify it. However, these figures such as Donald Rumsfeld, etc., have in certain cases, done things to avoid consequences. So it's not as though they have never been faced with consequences before. It's just that they have a good way of negating them before they happen or evading them if they potentially could. So let's go to my story about fish. I came across this article that described fish singing to each other, underwater music, repeating calls, and overlapping fish create a chorus of sorts. This was taken in Perth, Australia, by people at Curtin University. In Western Australia, over an 18-month period, these recordings were made, and seven distinct fish choruses were identified happening at dawn and dusk. So just like birds that sing as the day begins and ends, these fish are also singing. And I will include uh, sounds of that going on here. (laughs) 
So those sounds that you heard, that was a black jewfish, and that's the kind of low And then the kind of buzzing, grunting call is a terra punted. And the third is a batfish. Very interesting. You can find an episode of the podcast Mysterious Universe with an interview of a fish expert. Fish having democratic decisions, um, farting to, to cast their vote, yes or no, as a large group communicating with clicks and grunts, and just because a language doesn't take the form that we understand it doesn't mean that it's not some kind of language. And I've been thinking of this concept a lot lately that, you know, for a while the great man theory ran history. That's true, you know, Genghis Khan did rewrite half of the world, but history is not necessarily driven by great men. More accurately, odd abstract forces, things that only big data will eventually come to tell us about. Locusts are a form of grasshopper, closely related, but they're two different creatures. When grasshoppers get to a certain density in formation, they become a swarm. Condition is met where something in their genetic structure clicks on and off. It triggers and they become locusts. Their bodies change and the texture of their exoskeleton changes and they behave differently and they are locusts then. Wild hogs, similarly, if a pig escapes from a farm and runs off into the wilderness, after a certain, you know, six, eight months, something, they will change physically and become wild boars again. In a physical process, their tusks and skeleton grow, and it's interesting. I wonder if you get enough people in a space, they will begin to behave differently. Which brings us to our next story, the massive nationwide prison strike going on in its fourth week, as of the 1st of October in U.S. federal and state prisons across the country, and virtual silence on the part of most media outlets, including NPR, which I find curious. The public obviously does not include people in prison, which is kind of the point. We're supposed to segregate the people that have been deemed unworthy of being able to function in society, except that sociopaths, who by definition have a special kind of disorder that makes it very easy for them to not care about other people and use them for gain, that makes them very rich. And that's essentially what this conflict is about. The strike action is coordinated as a work stoppage to shut down the de facto slave labor system that exists in the United States. And Alabama is high up on the list of particularly heinous state prison systems. But I see a picture here of a prison work gang in Texas all white uniforms, mostly black bodies, and it's a shot from behind all of them, and there's a man on a horse in a hat. And when I saw it, I thought it was out of, you know, the 20s or 30s, but no, nope, I see standard shoes and, you know, modern clothing on the CO or whatever. It's disturbing, the fact that if you're subjugated to prison, your labor is, becomes free at that moment. If you're in the South, especially in Alabama, you're working on farms that were essentially 200 years ago, slave plantations in often similar conditions. It's astounding when one considers not only do we incarcerate more of our population than any other country in the world in history, but also that there is no uniform standard of living in those places. And most often the standard is set at a baseline of near subhumanity and any neglect of that line results in subhuman treatment, and most often in that line is hideously abused. So we are the media. Uh, I, I get frustrated with stories. One article that I read through, it's a decently sized article, and the first half of it, paragraph after paragraph, was an, an indictment of how little it was being covered in media, as if the person writing the article forgot that online journalism is the media, and as Jello Biafra said it, don't hate the media, become the media. That's my greatest fear, if not the greatest fear of a lot of citizens of this country, is being sent to jail and being lost in the system, which happens every day. And that has plenty of power, even for people living outside of prisons. For example, a large proportion of the opposition to total legalization of marijuana in California is from prison guard unions, because if there are fewer people in prison, then 
their hours will be cut. And the decision might come down to whose fault is it really that you have that job? And how personally adept are you at living this life outside of having a position of power? How close are you to that line of sadist in uniform? The uniform does not make you a sadist, but it certainly helps you express it in a lot of ways. So I will drink my next story. An adorable little robot out of three robots has become self-aware. There's a classic test of self-awareness called the wise men puzzle. And in this hypothetical test of being, King calls three of the wisest men in his country together and puts a blue or a white hat on their heads. They can all see each other, but they can't see themselves, and they're not allowed to talk between them. The king says, I promise one of you is wearing a blue hat. I promise that this contest is fair. And whoever is smart enough to figure out what color hat that they're wearing, using that information will become my wealthy advisor. This test has been updated for AI. The robots are told that they'll be giving a dumbing pill that will make them paralyzed and silent. And this pill is delivered by tapping them on the top of the head. And so the tester taps each of them on the head in turn and says, which pill did you receive? They pause. One of them stands up and says, I don't know. And then it, it kind of reacts to its own voice and then starts waving its hand kind of excitedly and says, sorry, I know now. I was able to prove that I was not given the dumbing pill. Vice Motherboard covered that story. It's coming, people. It's adorable now, but these are adorable little bodies that they have. We'll, we'll see. They're running combine harvesters. Not too sure about that. I was going to take the time today to cover the carbon tipping point that we've reached, the 400 parts per million atmospheric carbon levels, but read the story if you want to motherboard. The title of the story is Goodbye World, We've Passed the Carbon Tipping Point for Good, which should tell you all you should know about how I don't want to talk about the story tonight, but I will rejoin it at some other point, hopefully with more follow-up articles, perhaps a panel discussion on it. I don't have the heart for it tonight. And if you read this article, really if you're just aware of the climate situation Listen to Another World by Antony and the Johnsons. Make sure you're alone and, and able to express emotions safely because it's pretty devastating. They're saying 2030 when we really start to see major biological loss. Here we go into the future. To continue the theme of prisons, and just to note this, I learned this fact this week. The largest distributor of mental health care, if you will, in the United States, is a wing of the Twin Towers Correctional Facility in Los Angeles, in this country where we have decided that mentally ill people who commit crimes and people who are not mentally ill who commit crimes are the same, except that mentally ill people are harder to take care of and easier to legally sedate. This results in a massive 1.5 million square foot panoptic security system structure in a close proximity to a major civic center in Los Angeles, California. It's horrifying, the Twin Towers Correctional Facility. The census clock, the census population clock online, it's a little scrolling clock that updates currently, I think every 12 seconds. On average, one person comes into the country between people being born, people dying, someone coming over the border legally or illegally, and leaving the border legally or illegally, our population grows net one person every 11 seconds. Population 324 million and some change is roughly outdone by the current number of guns suspected to be in the United States at this time. And so I wanted to write a song about that. This is Everyone a Gun. Three hundred twenty-four million six hundred four. 
14. That was in some of the better movies. What do you like? And from these large concerns of ours, I'm going to move you into very local matters. I am in this band, The Dizzy. I play piano for them, and I also sing. They sing as well. We have a singer. He sings, and that's the main thing that he does, besides write really interesting songs that are references to movies that a lot of people have seen, and a lot of those people have also made movies. We write songs about things that we don't actually do ourselves. These aren't songs about us, and we're not really singing the songs. We're just kind of showing you what those songs might sound like if they were played by people. We're putting out a record that I am currently putting together in my basement, physically making all of the parts for it. It's called Wrapped in Plastic by The Dizzy. That's a record. It's on vinyl, except it's a CD. Figure that out when you come to the show October 11th at the Syndicate Lounge. It's a $3 cover. We're going to release to you the CD that's on vinyl. We're going to release to you an 8x10 glossy headshot of the band 
the lost screenplay for the Dizzy docudrama, the Maku docudrama, wrapped in plastic with all the lyrics and the liner notes and all the other stuff. There are going to be buttons in a foot by foot vinyl package. You can buy it for $20 at the Syndicate Lounge on October 11th. Find the Dizzy on Facebook. That's that. Please understand me. The FDA are really our closest allies on this. Jim was really a good friend to a fault. Jim sat. His chief crossed the room with the gleaming tumbler. There is a routine to this process, Mr. Casey, and we find that impatience only increases stress for yourself and those you care about. Yes? Hasn't it before? Casey shivered but clenched against words so he would not tremble with his own cup refilled and then with dregs emptied for the sharing that was so peacefully orchestrated for his own creeping dis-ease. A drink to discuss matters. Casey had not been active, and despite re-election following two months of campaign operation from a hospital bed post-surgery, and even that turnout being soft, he was able to retain his position and house in his district, a largely unpopulated mining town where he remained most of the year, returning to Washington to find his mail and feed his boa constrictor in the D.C. condo terrarium. What a fresh feeling that was each time, dropping the mice in. When people raise their voices, they usually mean to get something out of it, Jim offered from the arm of the Amini sofa. Casey, standing by the mantle of the false fireplace, woke up looking at it wilting gracefully beneath Jim's being. A lot of people use it as a medicine because it helps delineate the symptoms and alleviate problems from this specific, this uh, unique, uh, this uh, this type of lung issue caused from the minds, that cancer. Our best chance is to secure funding that we have, and that is the money that we get from the national insurance supply for protecting the national health. And that funding is best and only applied to the common, the most widely acceptable treatment we can come forward with while maintaining security. And this mind stuff, we... Casey, we have only been able to decide amongst our own ranking people that, regrettably, your cause is going to have to move on and suck it up this time, Robert. Now, this herbal remedy thing, see, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe, and we have a good product. People get good help. They're better scientists than Farmer John, and we can't have our own people trying to decide what the agency does when it comes to policy. There's no hard line on this that we can drive up to on these things, but it gets drawn sure enough. Now, just hold on a second, Robert, let me talk. The room was crossed again. Mr. Casey... Mr. Casey, our organization cannot classify this substance in the schedule that you are suggesting. On account of the research you have, it simply cannot be the ethical choice. There are addicts in this world, son. This may be a simple plant, and so is the coffee bean, but so is DMT, and look at that. The potential effects on this particular industry, the economics of the thing. These are complex matters, you understand. The effect, not to mention on my industry and yours individually, well... We have certain evidentiary standards to the Congress regarding the justification for the proposed action, and at this time we must insist on your cooperation. He crossed the room again to look into Robert Casey's steaming eyes. Casey could not blink and his phone buzzed in his pocket. A small flush of wet urine met the slightly hard pad of the less fresh bit from earlier. Mr. Casey, do you wish to resign this position? No, no, daddy. I think the Kratoa decision should continue nicely then. Soma and Valium will sell better nationally rather than locally. Do you understand me? Casey swallowed again. Y yes, I do. That's good. A lot of sick people are going to get good help, 
this natural problem will pass us and the industry hospitals for those people. The jails work fine. Those thieving felches will not find any cracked out cure for anything on just any shelf before I die a horrible unnatural death. Your mother didn't know where I missed the mark with you either, but I will not fail this country the same way, and you'd sure do well to keep her in mind. You will never be able to live with yourself if you fail us all, and I have fucked the grave and gone away forever like she did. Casey very nearly wept, but his face retained the proper admission of cause and effect. You will find a report on your desk in the morning. Be a good boy, soldier, and sign it, and this all will be over, and you can go back to your filth mind, people. All good, Jim? Mr. Casey. The chief crossed the room again to the door. His glass went down on the silver tray as he left, and it was removed and replaced and processed through the kitchen and steamed and procedured back to the office's fine old wood stocking cupboard. By the time it had, Bob Casey had volunteered his story and information to various sources, and by the time they went out, he was dying of a tragic overdose, having been found with a lethal amount of the Croteau supplement that he had advocated so for during his ambling career. Despite all medical reports affirming that there is no threshold dose of the substance. Before we get into our interview with Omari Jazz, which was recorded many months ago. What in the hell was that? My apologies, it's noisy in here. I'm going to air one of his pieces called Samsara. Samsara is the name of the world that we perceive, the world of confusion, illusion, the piece Samsara he dedicated to Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, and it is in memory of abominably too numerous victims of wanton police violence and wanton violence in general, especially perpetrated in the name of archaic prejudice. On SoundCloud, he wrote, if you are a vocalist, a lyricist, if you want to put words on top of this, then do so. You can download it at soundcloud.com slash omarijazz slash samsara. Record over it. He just requests that you send him what you record.
So, Mr. Jazz. Hello. Hi. Amari Jazz, we have him today. And uh, this is like, this is a conversation I've been wanting to have for a while. Weird, man. I'm glad to have it with you as well, man. It's uh, cool to be in the same town as you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, We've never had like an in-depth conversation about sound, so. Not yet. Well, I'm looking forward to getting into it, you know. You have a mastery of, of I don't know, timing. And I've seen you perform live like, several times, but oh, a couple at the Syndicate, I think once at the Nick and once um, at a house show. And every single time it was shocking i like that <laughs> i appreciate it man yeah moment moment by moment and kind of like every few every now and then you're just like dig like it cook <laughs> like fuck yeah you know? <laughs> yeah it has like those it's spiky yeah 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 it's real it can be real spiky, especially with those sets and those uh in that in this specific time frame of like me doing music it's full jolts of stuff here and there yeah well you you don't rely on repetition to build intensity you go for different things yeah i'm all like blah 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 blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you transcribe that one. I, I feel like we work on different planes, on different stations, but we've got a, a similar understanding of how music works. What's your process? How do you start? You, if you walk into a completely new thing, how do you get that going? Man, it's pretty different every time. But most times I find myself hovering between like either starting with a melody or starting with drums. Because I say like, musically, I'm not like trained in anything. I'm sort of like willy nilly. I'll pick up an instrument and just mess around on it and then try and figure out what sounds good. I play everything by ear. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'll say that I have more of a strength in like percussion and drums. Like that's sort of like where I started with. Like as a kid, I played the drums a lot. Was that your first instrument? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Picked up the drums, playing possum pans as a kid. And so like that started to echo into what's happening now a little bit. It didn't come from anywhere, though. Like, it can sort of start with, like, some sort of found sound loop. It's not exactly like, oh, I need to, like, make a standard kit in what I use. And I use Ableton to make music, and it's, like, really streamlined. It was made sort of by people who know the producing sensibilities so that they can sort of, like, shortcut everything and make it, like, real smooth. Because if you've used DAWs before, like, they are, they can be kind of blocky sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it has, like, this duality to it where you can play live and be in the studio. And the process sort of switches up a lot because of that fluidity. So, like, I'll start with drums by, like, triggering samples or, you know, by playing them back over the keyboard because you can, like, time stretch samples and stuff. I mean, the melody might turn into drums one day or the drums might turn into the melody, which is so weird about it. Like, it's that open, like, where you might hear, like, a certain, like, frequency within what you're playing which is like oh yeah i want to completely flip that into something else yeah slow a drum down and you get a, a tone and then you can start yeah moving stuff. exactly yeah. <laughs> it's funny i know it's kind of off topic but like people uh will like take a justin bieber song or something like that and then slow it down by like five million or something like that yeah like five hundred thousand and it ends up being this beautiful like orchestral <laughs> piece <laughs> like yeah. like this sort of like synthy reverby thing and it's I don't know, stuff like processes like that are really cool where you just like mangle it up and then it's just this new thing. I think the other day I made a, a beat out of a video of a dog on a subway in New York and that just turned into like some random percussive hit <laughs> in, a, in this track that ended up being made. Cool. Oh. You start with the sound and you work from that. Sound. Yeah. Just throw some sound at it. And <laughs> it's, uh, it ends up what it ends up being. So if you start with drums, do you pick something that you like and then loop it and then like go back and alter it and give it variation or how's that how's that process work? Yeah, that's a pretty apt description of it. I'll start something and in Ableton you can start a clip at a, like a tempo or whatever. First thing I usually do is actually set the tempo because but, it uh, cuts it up in measures or like by right eight and count instead and of time. And you can extend it to whatever measure or time signature that you want, which is really cool. What I'll do is like. I'll play it live and I don't really like to quantize my stuff unless I'm going for like a specific thing in mind because the quantization has like a really distinct feel. It's like real mechanic and like I don't think any human could really do it like that. I think that's like where the edge of syntax sort of is. Right. Like between computers and uh, live performance. I don't know. Usually I'll start with some sounds like messing around with something and then I'll keep it looping. Then I'll continue to add stuff and then I'll kind of like listen to that for a while and take away some things. But at the end of the day, I think I'm a maximalist. So I end up with all these different clips and stuff like because I'm just going like stream of consciousness and then I end up like chiseling more so than, you know, laser beaming it. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it, it usually ends up being me like 
carefully manipulating or nudging certain clips or nudging one sound, you know, to yeah. the right or left. Yeah. And so a chiseling, the, the idea of uh, I like I like maximalist because I think I'm guilty of that sometimes, yeah. and <laughs> and the, the chiseling away is it, that's where like the nuance is what impresses me. Because like I said, you don't rely on repetition. You you don't continue to feed people the same climax over and over. It's always dynamic in it. And it's in that it's not all the stuff that you have going by the end. It's what came in and out. Yeah. I mean, as cliche as it may sound, it's sort of like the journey is sort of the destination in that way. Yeah. Like you said, like I could be classified in the same sonic realm as like a lot of dubstep and electronic stuff. And that stuff is just like rise and fall rise and fall on it it gets tired <laughs> after a while i just want stuff that like gives you like some sort of like mental energy instead of just like a physical because i feel like that stuff is very like muladara is very like of this plane as far as it uh there's like just like a physical tact to it which is cool but i want my stuff to sort of hit like higher up as far as uh like what you're listening to it for rather than it being like, oh, yeah, I just want to turn up to this. You know, I want it to be like some more like headphone music or something. Yeah. So I think that's the experience dictates, like the way I want people to experience kind of dictates what I'm going into it, like like the mental. State. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, I feel I feel a great connection. And then I think that's where our, this, we have a lot of simpatico with that idea. Where instead of taking a big jump from verse to chorus, you're, every step along the way is supposed to be a moment. And it, yeah. It guides you into... An um, overarching experience instead. I'm not, like, necessarily partial to, like, things needing to be, like, a certain length or whatever. I've listened to, like, a lot of Fela Kuti. His tracks will be so incredibly long. They'll be, like, you know, 13 minutes long. I mean, they're vamping on, you know, uh, repetition. But at the same time, it's just, like, as far as, like, composition goes, like, he didn't give a shit. You know, like, you were just, like, in this vibe. Mm -hmm. It takes you from this thing to this thing. Yeah. And on. It's all, it's all development. It's not, the song doesn't become an end to like the means of whatever effect you're having. It's like the whole song is the means to something else. Exactly. I was actually reading something on a producer slash DJ guy from LA, uh, Daedalus. And he was kind of talking about like how songs and even albums, you could take it in, you know, in the macro are just sort of like a quick little view into like an ongoing sort of frequency or vibration or exploration. So nothing is like a definitive end, really, if it's all sort of like cycling and together. Yeah, if you intend that continuity, then nothing's out of place. Right. Yeah, I'm really attracted to that to that concept, which is a, a lot of fun. Yeah, I don't I don't want to like pigeonhole it to just like, oh, yo, all right, there's that, there's his sound. You know, there's his song structure. I'd wanted to just i wanted to be pretty different every time which is funny that you would say that you think there's a lot of variation and stuff because i get caught up a lot in my own creative processes and like in my own just mental disdain i'll just be like oh man you know i repeated that measure like way too many times or this beat is just only consisting of this this and the same thing over and over again and that can be powerful yeah. i don't know if i use repetition and rhythm enough necessarily in what i'm doing so, an interview question out of the way. Okay. How long have you been doing this? And what are the projects that you're involved in currently? All right. Let's see. I've been producing since I was in like late ninth grade. And then you just turned 21. I like did. at the beginning of the month. Yeah. yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's all downhill from here. What, yeah. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. We reached our milestone. Yeah. <laughs> Next one's 65. Yep. Exactly. It. It's like the, every other year is just going to be like, oh, it's birthday. Great. Cool. I guess it's been almost, so was that like 15 or something at the time? So like six years? Since you've been doing kind of growing into the thing that you're doing now. Right. And I say with no shame, there were times where it was just not coming together at all. It's like, what? A, and, it, and it comes from a lighthearted place because yeah. that's just my current self looking back on what that was. And I'd be like, I would have never made it now if I sounded like that now. <laughs> but back then I was just like, hanging out and experimenting and you know just making bedroom beats which i still mm -hmm. am it's just kind of like but like really bedroom beats like i just opened this program for the first time <laughs> and i'm just like slapping on my computer pretty experimental so i'd say about like five to six years which is crazy because it's just like i'm four more years and i'll be would have been doing this for like for a decade mm -hmm. it's wild 
It's kind of a bugged out concept to me. So four more years, you're 25. So that's almost by 30. That would have been half your life that you've been doing this. Yeah. Which is pretty wild because uh, I didn't see that coming. Like yeah. at the time, I was really doing a lot of visual art. I went to school for visual arts. So I was doing that. That was my primary, my primary like medium. Like I got a Mac and then started messing with GarageBand. And that just spiraled out of control. <laughs> the rabbit hole opens. Literally, yeah. like, if I, I'm not addicted to anything, like, physically, but mentally, I'm completely addicted to, like, making beats mm-hmm. and being on the computer at 3 a.m. Like, yo, I gotta, like, make sure I find the right snare for this. <laughs> it's, I'm just gonna find what I love and let it kill me. I always remember that quote. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, this is my favorite kind of dysfunction. Right. Hey, I'm gonna die trying, man. There That's we- all we can do. And you know what's cool about making beats is that it also doubles as a food. And that's what most people don't know. It's just, it's just beats and beats. So I just, when I'm making some beats, I go and fry some beats in the <laughs> oven. And, you know, it, it, it feeds me, me and my family. The, <laughs> the borscht tapes <laughs> yeah. coming out soon. Exactly. Just like raw. I mean, like raw beats. <laughs> These joints is real raw. But uh, let's see. As far as projects, right now... My main focus is my uh, hip hop duo Ancestor with uh, David Redwine, who goes by Slanguage. Mm-hmm. He's an amazing rapper and just linguist and artist in general. Yeah, he's also in uh, the group Pen Pals out of Tuscaloosa. We've been working on some stuff together. Wow, seven seven months now. Literally just pouring out of our brains it's like really organic we're in the studio just like oh hey you like that beat or whatever oh i like those rhymes and it's just like whoa it's the best it's yeah and it and even when we're just making stuff on the fly it's just i'll be sitting there like adding layers and adding layers and stuff and he's just writing and writing i try and keep like a bass groove usually or we'll just flip it on his head that's a big project i'm working on right now like we're trying to finish an album so we've been playing all these shows and we don't really have anything to give people like they don't walk away with anything but the experience right now right which i like which i think is cool because it's like that's the only place where you can go and catch it it's like this short frequency i mean we have two tracks on soundcloud which is surprisingly enough have gotten us pretty far as far as like getting shows down and all that well if but, you're good out of the gate somebody's you know people are gonna take notice i mean I have a lot of confidence in what we're doing just because David, like, he really carries it. He's just got, like, this presence there that is sort of infectious. And I like kind of being the guy in the background. But we almost end up sort of being in the foreground, too, because I'm just, we're just really vibing. So it's interesting, you know, it's, it's, can't have one without the other in this sense. That's got to be exciting, though, to, like, watch somebody totally in their element and, and be that plugged in and, and especially with this type of stuff, since it's like coming from a more quiet, collaborative space, we start in the studio and then it ends up on the stage. And it's not really like in the reverse. We're like not making the stuff on the fly. And then like, yo, that's a dope song. And we need to go record that in the studio. Like in regards to it being on stage. Mm-hmm. It gets to gestate right. together. Yeah. And so like, I think that's where like people really get that. It's like, oh, this is like a truly a collaborative effort. You know, I don't mind. Just, you know, I pass off the live energy to him you know and like i do backup vocals and stuff sometimes and i emphatically twist knobs which just seems to rile up a certain amount of fun but he really knows how to like captivate people and um no no that synergy is just like those two things coming together i think you would captivate him in a different way if it wasn't like a art collaboration yeah right? and so like i don't know it's a specific vibe yeah it feels like it's nice. It's refreshing tackling musical gamut with a partner in that way. Is, it's always really cool because it, it grounds you in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Like you don't necessarily have access. Well, I mean, you do like have access to your sensibilities, but they manifest differently. Yeah. I feel like when you collaborate, they just sort of manifest in a different way because you, you give up a certain amount of control. And something about that is real zen. Like, when we're making stuff, it just feels like, you know, I want to relinquish as much as possible and also retain as much as possible. I don't know, there's this duality to it. Well, it's yeah. like sex or dancing or any of those 
uh, intertwined activities. There's somebody leading and somebody following, but only at different moments. It's right. not, you know, ideally, ideally, it's not supposed to be a one way show. Back and forth. Yeah. And I, that analogy resonates heavily with me because I'm a Pisces too. Yeah. I think. So if there is, yeah. if you catch me on any given day, I might just be walking down the street by myself, like, do I have Yep. <laughs> Everything dual dualities, yin and yang, I, black and white. I am a self, but the self does not exist. <laughs> yeah. Self's an illusion between two points. Yeah, I'm nothing. Real. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's real shit. Like, <laughs> I'll I'll have my psycho babble every now and then, which is fun. But um, yeah, man, the ancestor is like I'm putting a lot of energy into that, and hopefully we'll get our album done real real soon. Let's see, solo stuff as far as the album goes is kind of on. I don't know. That's tentative still cooking not worried about it you know yeah. it's one of those things where i'm just like sonically i can get by on putting out a track every other now and then and then folks are all right but i really want to let it you know bake my friend elliot cleverton he plays keys for the dead balloon sometimes and he uh, has that band meridian he's a good friend of mine and uh we are going to be working on some stuff i'll probably be helping him do some meridian stuff and then we also have a duo together you know, that's still cooking, but it we've got like four or five tracks or something like that. And it's really fun because I come from like this electronic technical perspective and he's kind of folding into that coming from like a musical and, you know, theoretic background. And I think it's really cool because I'm trying to get to his place that he's trying to come away from and he's trying to get into the place I'm coming away from as far as like our sensibilities and in music so he wants to learn ableton and i want to learn piano real well and so it's a nice you know hot potato which is a uh, i'm really grateful for that to be able to like share that zone with people and it's always really refreshing you know people are like yo i i, I like that and it's just like i'm always in denial i'm like what man you don't like that what am i talking about i just like the you know you don't like that and i was like no 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 let me like you know do something with that and i don't know that always kind of warms my heart just because i, I have a <laughs> Sort of a uh, with music sometimes I can have such a critical eye towards my my own self that when somebody else comes in and it's just like they want to roll with what I got, it's just like yo, all right, yeah, all right, that gives me some confidence there. Likewise, I love seeing that in other people and just being like, yo, I want to do something with that, and it's always ends up being like some fringe that they wouldn't like if it was produced by themselves or like or vice versa. So they're like, oh, look at this thing that I made or whatever, and I'm like, yo, that's the dopest thing ever. <laughs> And then they're like, what? What are you talking about? And then it spirals from there. And I feel like that, those are, there are a lot of beautiful moments in that. It's very educational. I've heard a lot of jazz musicians say that, like, people come up to them and say, well, man, I didn't really have any idea what jazz was about. But, like, watching you do what you do and, and watching how it happens, you know, in front of me, I, I think I got some kind of idea. That's it's like, awesome. oh, yeah, thank you. Not me, but, like, whoever, you know, thank you. That's the point. Like, right. It, something if you show somebody something that they wouldn't normally get into and you can bring them to some understanding where they bring something new to the table to meet that mm -hmm. that thing jazz is a good example because it's so obtuse for so many people right. if you can bring something to the table with them so that they can meet you halfway and understanding something that they might not put their feet in normally that's so huge yeah for real like you can lift them to a certain perspective <laughs> it's, it's actually really funny because people come to my sets expecting I've had a lot of people who, like, aren't in our scene or, like, scene is relative. I mean, like, just in Birmingham Central where they're, you know, catching the Komodo shows that happen. I've had some people come to my shows and just be like, yo, what? I thought you were going to be, like, playing trumpet or, like, you know, doing, like, some crazy bass solos and stuff. No, it's not Omari Jazz. It's yeah. Omari Jazz. Just that. come to the show. Yeah, that's it. You know, <laughs> this is the name. <laughs> why, why did you go with that? That's my middle name. It's my real name. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, shouts out to my dad and my mom for that. So. That's wicked cool. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, that's been my uh, surefire conversation started <laughs> for me. It's just like, so is your real name Omar Jazz? And it's like, <laughs> yes. So I pull out my uh, ID. You've activated my trap card. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you got ordained right out of the gate. That's intense. You see, but it made me lazy. Yeah, you know, so I'm just like I wish I had a moniker like to go by. Like I want to be something else. And I've actually been thinking about that a lot. You know, like what other sort of name? What could I don? If I do do that moniker, I don't want my like real. I want it to be like some Batman shit. Like I don't want my identity to be 
revealed for a while. Yeah. I want to like have that duality. Birmingham is an interesting place because I just got back from New York uh, just on a visit. You know, I've been living here for a while. It's actually really interesting how many people have heard about stuff that's happening down here. Really? Or like, you know, just curious in general. Like, they're like, yo, I heard that, you know, Birmingham has got like, you know, dope food and dope music. And I'm like, what? Like, what? Because the usual like disposition is like, oh, this is like, you guys have toilets. Oh, my God. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Which is so esoteric. Like, how I don't even see how you think that <laughs> within the same country. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really cool seeing, like, what's brewing here. And I think if, it's of no coincidence that, like, some of the most awesome musicians have come from here that a scene would be brewing and all this, like, experimental music. And, you know, just really solid music is coming out of here without, you know, it's not having to, it's cultivating itself. Yeah, there's no industry. It's not like... Right. You know, there's no sort of like cold industrial aspect to it. If I had been anywhere else, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Right. So, I'm really thankful for Birmingham in those ways because, you know, going to punk shows, going to metal shows and indie shows and even the electronic shows that I wasn't playing. Yeah, there's a there's a burgeoning noise scene here too and there's just yeah, so much stuff man. going on. Like Balcony View and like Daniel Ferris and mm-hmm. all of them, like they're killing it. People who are like really trying to make it, like, yo, I need to, like are really just focused on, you know, blowing up. I feel yeah. like sometimes they miss this certain treasure experience. It's like when you're playing an empty room full of the people that are only, you book the show with like likewise mm-hmm. music, there's such a like deep, I don't know, concentration. There's something that you share mm-hmm. there that I think is really special because either way, like 95% of the time, I would rather be in a room just like sharing my music with heads who also are in the, the same type of stuff I am or make the same type of stuff. So, something real beautiful there. Yo, last time I saw Balcony View, he was, uh, where was it? Was that Saturn? And his set it blew me away because he had like Micro Korg XL. Then he has, like, some other Moog stuff. I don't know. He just had, like, this super ethereal driving set. It was just, like, as close as you could, you know, manifest energy just, like, without drums or nothing. Like, without even really hard contours. It was just, like, this real subtle. It was just such a long draw. It was just, like, this 15-minute draw, like, swell. And then I think he, like, turned up, like, the LFO frequency and it just opened all the way up and it, like my mind was it's, it was it was awesome it, it takes you into this weird space where you're hearing everything but you're not in any one moment you're right. just you, it totally takes you and i've never it's a totally different experience style of doing things will always have like a really special place in my heart i would make an ambient track every now and then which is really fun but i haven't like quite mastered it it's like uh i don't know there's a feel there that there's a draw to it, like a certain touch that I always really appreciate in that type of music. I don't know, a specific headspace that it gets me in. It's just like real, like, you know, meditative on a rainy day, looking out the window. I'm like, yo, I need to go listen to like some harp or something like that. Yeah. I don't know how long we've been going. I really need these to bathroom. That, that's cool. You can go ahead. I'll talk to the thin air while you're doing that. Yeah, if you're looking for listening material for a rainy day, which this one is turning out to be, I'll put a link in the description of this podcast so I can find the exact link. But it's a recording that an audio engineer took in the late 70s, I think, of crickets, like a chorus of crickets chirping, and slowed it down proportional to the lifespan of a cricket and a human. This beautiful, cascading, like really melodic, harmonic thing that's happening. We just experience time differently than them. There's an Adventure Time episode about the food chain. This wizard brings them through the food chain. So they're like, they're like a caterpillar and then the bird <laughs> comes and eats them and then they become the birds and then the birds oh. die. They're, they're plants that are feeding off of the birds. The, there's a line while they're plants and they're singing this weird trancy song. For plants, a day is short. And sees the the sun's just going over and over them. Yeah, so yeah. Th- th- we don't we're so wrapped up in our own ways of perceiving the world that we're blinded to the fact that we just are perceiving the world. If plants lead a different existence than we do, and I don't, I have no reason to doubt that all all things are are aware in some way. We just don't have the ability to understand that awareness that they have. Well, I have a conversation with potheads a lot, and it's like this thing's not an object. This, this thing that you're doing is not an object that you, it's not a commodity that you receive. It's, a, it's an entity that, that is dying for you to communicate with it. And we know that plants communicate with proteins. They, they're wired in the ground with fungus between them. 
uh, to communicate with each other. They trade proteins back and forth and they help each other and they fight each other. They have all this coexistence. That's how they communicate. So it, it only leads one to assume that we can't talk to plants. They don't speak English. That's not, that doesn't exist. If you're going to communicate with a plant, you've got to make that protein exchange. And you do that by getting it into your body in whatever way your body's built, hardwired in to receive that. We've got cannabinoid receptors and all, you know. Right. So, if, we're, okay. if you're going to contact a plant, if you're going to have a plant talk to you, then if you smoke marijuana or if you eat marijuana or if you eat psilocybin or something, that's the thing talking to you. Yeah. That's a communication thing and it's you're sharing your head with whatever else you just put into your body. People need to get behind that, I think. Because uh, if you believe in an intravenous system as a human, like how your body is communicating with yourself mm -hmm. or with itself, then you can do the same thing that's happening with all these other organisms. It's just the fact that they don't have the same features, some sort of like organismophobia. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. like a different head of like xenophobia, I think. It's just like, yeah. look, that thing doesn't have a face, so obviously there's no way it can experience the same things that I do. Which, you know, they may not be conscious to our level, but it's like, you know, there's process happening there. Well, how patient do you have to be to be a tree? Yeah, right. You know, like how much learning does that take? And how thankful should you be as a human? Because this thing is providing you with, you know, breath. So, if you can whittle down as much as that gift as possible, take as least of it as possible and talk to the tree in some way. Or, you know, trying to at least be nice to it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I think that's a first step <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. Thank whatever you're putting in your head for being there and, and right. welcome it into your space. I've always found it like really interesting when people just start smoking weed as a party thing or as like a social thing. Like, there's so much of a lesson you can take some away from it. And, you know, that's like a day to day thing, you know, whether you get in, choose to get intoxicated or not. Okay. Yeah, whatever you're getting into your head, through your eyes or whatever, there's something there to be grasped. Right, right. There's like from moment to moment, there's something that you can, you know, you can pull away from that stuff. Also, just don't have an existential crisis when you're walking down the block. You just don't want to be that either. So. Yeah. Wait, what am I? Yeah. I'm a lying monkey? Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Back up. Yeah, hold when on. did this start? He's like, no, nah, he's, he's a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I saw some meme the other day and I was like, alien dad went out 24 million years ago to get cigarettes and we haven't seen him since. Oh, yo, yo. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was really funny. Yeah, yeah. Man, aliens came down. Like, I just feel like either A, they're already here, or two, they're just like so far advanced that it would just be futile. They're just like, they see us as like a Euroboros, sort of like eating our own tail. You know, us versus one of them. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck I'm living inside of. I don't know what this is. Yeah. I have no, I have no like to stand on. So if they're, if they're, if we might be them, I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. They come down here and just like, oh my God, look at all these aliens we found. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> what, what, how, why do we get to have the... <laughs> the Wiga Zorp -Zorp, you alien. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Humankind is just going to keep on experiencing like weird, you know, natural thing after weird natural thing. All these uh, scientific items just starting to reveal themselves slowly but surely. And then we're like, all right, what's the next thing? What does it really tell us about the nature of, like, why we experience these things? That's a fun journey to go down. But, like, I think even when we die, it's going to be, like, the same shit. It's going to be, like, some even, you know, crazier, bugged out stuff. Like, like right when you're born, like, you're in here and you're like, yo, yo, this is bugged out. This is <laughs> wild. Like, I'm born. I don't even know. I have a concept of what that, like, born is yet. I don't even know why I'm, I'm talking English in my head. What is that? And, uh... I feel like when we pass away, it's going to be like some of the same shit, like something even crazier than this. Moving on. Yeah. I heard a story of like a kid talking to his kid brother or like his baby brother that had just been born. And the kid goes up to the crib and he's like whispering to his little brother and the mom's like, what are you, what are you saying? And he's like, I'm asking him what it's like, what's God like? Cause I'm, yeah. I'm starting to forget. Oh my it's like, God. fuck, uh, fuck, 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 fuck. Like, took you long enough. Oh, like, we didn't even tell you yeah. about God. We didn't even tell you all that shit. Yeah. you just like, Whoa, wait a minute. It's, I mean, that just goes to show that, you know, we, we grasp at it the older we get. And it's just like, it just becomes a, this ephemeral idea that's ever close and ever far. You know, like, at one point we were really close with it and we will be again. But, you know, somewhere in the middle, we start to get a little foggy. 
Uh, we learn a bunch of information. Right, about said thing, but we don't experience it like we were just talking about. So it's like it's almost the inverse. It's like something that will let us know everything is something that we only have information about, which we don't get to experience. Yeah, we get so hung up on the finest, finest details. It's like you said, talking, sitting in a bar over a beer talking about alternate dimensions and that's <laughs> yeah. not something you're experiencing that's yeah. an idea yeah, right. that you're you're trying to entertain and wrap your head around mm-hmm. but meanwhile that's the guiding force of the universe and whether you understand that or not you're still here yeah <laughs> like right. so it, in all in due time my dad actually told me as a kid i did that for some kid in new york we were passing by in strollers and i think my dad was like talking to the parent or something like that. I don't really remember the details of the story, but somehow it ended up with me just being like, hey, I remember you. Something like that. And we had never <sighs> met before. Yeah. And, you know, weird stuff like that does tend to happen. Yeah. I wish I could, like, access that yeah. same <laughs> consciousness, you know. Oh. If only. So, what are you doing next? Give me, give me the rundown on the dates that you've got coming up. Uh, next, I actually have a show with Ancestor okay. on Saturday. At a Desert Island Supply Company, and it's with this guy uh, David Liebehart from uh, Tim and Eric, which is going to be really weird. Whoa! Yeah, it's, it's strange, huh? You know the dude that does the puppets with the glasses. Yeah. Guy. How did he end up down here? You know, he, he's on tour. He tours a lot, and then um, he messaged me like asking about like, "Yo, where do I play in Birmingham?" And I like tried to direct him to some places, and they were all like, "Oh, they're not responding to my emails." Blah blah blah. So, I'm, Disco ended up picking him up. Wow. Which is dope. So, uh, yeah, that's the next show, which is Saturday. And then after that, it's pretty, you know, tentative. I'm trying to cut back on Ancestor shows so we can get into that album I was talking about. There's a lot of stuff happening in, like, May, but I need to, like, get my calendar together. Yeah. I know I'm going to be playing Kukuraka Festival up at uh, Horse Pens 40, which mm-hmm. is always a lot of fun. Thank you, man. This was great. Yeah, man, I was blast thank you for having me man this is such a calming space i needed that to just zone in not look at my phone at all and just have a cool ass conversation the days go by where i'm just like uh, sitting there it's like some idiocracy type shit which is more of a documentary than it is a <laughs> an actual uh satire yeah man thank you so much for having me on absolutely Dizzy. The Dizzy are the band that I'm playing in, and they're going to be my guests on the podcast, and I'll talk to them about that. And I'll talk to myself about it in the process. Now, But It's a Scam by Jackie Cotillard. That's me. Have a good week. Think cool things and be nice to yourself. Be a better parent to yourself than your parents were. Good night, everybody. What?
explain the tiny lines are marking from my face today. I can't complain. You come on all this way to just give a bad would say I live in a cave, but I couldn't stand the company of lots like me. I'd give up the chase and I could stay at your place. Price gone, price. A spade's a spade, God. I've dug myself a hole with little baby's hands. My time's a trade oh, I'm empty now with hands and paper left of me. I see astounded boutique proper citizens and boutique proper daisies, and I fed them wine and candy. I've sat on my gains to stipulate a starve of desperatocracy. I've dropped their glass of child on the floor. I pick it up, just it off, and give it back to them. But it's a scam, don't you know? When you see the lights in the brain close with amnesia. But it's a scam, can't you tell? That we live with poor decisions and you die from them. But it's a scam, there are studies, people write the stories You know all you should have to to have me burned in public view And then you stand taking my filthy hand You love me on the sick morning show Folks, it's been really great this week. Uh, we're going to see you all off and do a number. Yes, that's right, folks. We're going to play you off with a, uh, a little message, a uh, little song. Thanks for, uh, thanks for, thanks for listening.